As one of the most remarkable and innovative designs in motoring history, the Austin Mini, born from the demands of restricted fuel supplies, maintained its winning but practical looks throughout the course of 41 years without replacement or modification, making it one of the longest instances of a single car model holding on to the same outward appearance it received when new in the automotive world. However, in line with conventional cycles for model upgrades, the Mini's progenitor, Sir Alec Isagonis, conceived as early as 1967 a potential replacement for the original Mini, dubbed the BMC 9X, a car which carried over many of the incredible and functional properties of the classic, but would ultimately fail to make it to mass production. One of the many instances where the Mini would go on to outlive far younger cars which attempted to take over the mantle of this mighty machine. The Austin Mini was born from necessity, as in 1956, following the nationalisation of the Suez Canal by the government of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, a joint invasion force was launched by the forces of Israel, the United Kingdom and France, which lasted for just over one week, the fallout of which, due to a halting of oil shipments to Britain, resulted in a fuel crisis which hit the nation hard, meaning that larger cars from some of the UK's biggest manufacturers were losing out heavily in terms of sales based entirely on their fuel consumption thus resulting in the start of a trend for small but highly efficient super-mini cars. On the orders of Sir Leonard Lord, chairman of the British Motor Corporation, or BMC, designer Alec Isagonis was required to deliver an ongoing project to build a brand new small car concept as quickly as possible. And under codename ADO15, the first running prototypes of Project XC9003 were released in 1957 followed in August 1959 by the unveiling of what was dubbed the Morris Mini Minor and the Austin 7, an inspired creation that, through the mounting of the engine transversely above the gearbox, while married to tiny road wheels designed especially for the car with a compact suspension system, was able to marry looks with practicality and performance that would make it an icon, initially selling slowly before hitting it big in terms of commercial success at the dawn of the 1960s, the Mini not only providing a practical car in a small package, but was also the very embodiment of British eccentricity. Behind its famous body though, the Mini, aside from BMC making a loss on every car they sold because of competitive pricing, was an incredibly rushed machine due to the demands of Leonard Lord in getting the car released as soon as possible, and for that suffered a variety of mechanical and practical faults, examples including the engine accessibility being so poor that many garages would refuse to service Minis while the transmission in sump layout adopted by the car was hampered by the addition of an extra transfer drive, and subframes introduced during development added weight, cost and corrosion worries, early minis, due to the body engineering having been compromised, being known to leak profusely during the initial production run. Nonetheless, the Mini was still a massive hit for BMC, and was able to easily undercut larger car models so as to provide practicality and fuel efficiency, which was, at the time, barely ever a priority for most car firms except for in times of crisis, and Isagonis, who was appointed an OBE in 1964, moved on to other projects at BMC, including the ADO-16 or Austin 1100 of 1962, and the ADO-17 or Austin 1800 of 1964, cars which again were able to marry practicality and winning looks to create huge sales successes for the company, although Isagonis was never truly satisfied with the rushed state in which he'd left his crowning Mini and long desired to return to the model in order to iron out those mistakes which subtracted from what was otherwise a superb machine. In 1967, Isagonis took the rather unprecedented step of requesting that George Harriman, then head of new car development, step down from his role so that he may begin development on a mini replacement, a move which perturbed Harriman as he was not keen on looking backwards at older models such as the mini, and was instead focusing on the next generation front wheel drive projects, although after some convincing, he reluctantly agreed to Isagonis' request on the understanding that this development program was not in the mainstream BMC development schedule, and there would be no guarantees that production of the new car would be sanctioned. Now taking the role of head of new car development, Isagonis created a design team of hand-picked engineers, as had been his ethos during the development of the Mini, in order to help bring his new model to fruition, his mindset being to have the design team be comprised of trusted people who shared his perspective on the car creation process, and thereby accelerate the project's progression, with initial work on the new Mini replacement commencing during 1968, amid the background of BMC's merger with the Leyland Group to form the gigantic conglomerate known as British Leyland. Working to the strictest set of goals, Isagonis managed to create a totally new car which owed absolutely nothing to its predecessor, this radical new machine emerging as what was known as the 9X, which, astonishingly, managed not only to be shorter than the Mini at 9 foot 8 inches in length, 
rather than the previous ten foot and a quarter inch, but was also lighter and somewhat roomier, the car being a testament to the mastery that Isagonis had when it came to creating a small car design, with the 9X providing also superior front and rear headroom and legroom, although the driving position was, much like the original, noticeably compromised, while the dashboard design entailed an extremely slim fascia and strip speedometer, visually very similar to that of the Austin 1800 or similarly styled Austin Morris JU van. As for the styling of the 9X, this was penned by Fred Boubier and Sid Goebel, who created a smart and contemporary looking little machine which squared off its rounded corners as per the trends of the late 1960s and early 1970s, with the Carrozzeria Pininfarina being commissioned to undertake prototype building at their Turin workshop, the resultant machine bearing many visual similarities to the later Peugeot 104, and would have fitted into its anticipated market perfectly, thanks in part to the introduction of a hatchback on the 9X prototype that replaced the original Mini's tiny rear boot, an asset that Isagonis did not necessarily believe a Mini-sized car needed, but accepted that customers disagreed with his sentiments. While the 9X was indeed a smart, capable and innovative little car, George Harriman, as per his original stipulation, emphasised that he was unable to offer Isagonis any commitment to production, and because the British Motor Holdings Company, a short-lived successor firm created after BMC's takeover of Jaguar in 1966, was heading rapidly towards a Leyland takeover, the likelihood of a huge investment to replace their successful low-profit car was becoming increasingly remote, the company board knowing well that they would need a car like the Mini to support them financially in the inevitable fallout of the takeover. Regardless, following the formation of British Leyland during 1968, the foreseen financial turbulence led to a plethora of budgetary constraints, and 9X production, despite this project being not an official Leyland scheme and was manned by Isagonis and a small team of engineers, was starting to become a remote possibility, although Isagonis himself would not compromise on the most important aspect needed to bring the 9X to perfection, that being an entirely new chassis. To cut down on expensive gimmicks and other complex mechanics that would hamper the appeal of the new car, Isagonis gave the 9X McPherson struts at the front and a beam axle at the rear, issuing the proposed introduction of the revolutionary hydroelastic suspension system, which was being introduced on other small family cars in Leyland's lineup, including the 1100 and the 1800. Attempts to introduce hydroelastic suspension on the Mini, even though it was designed from the outset to accommodate this feature, meeting mixed reviews by consumer groups, the use of a conventional setup being cheaper to produce, and could be tuned to offer a softer and more compliant ride than the rather bouncy Mini. For power, Isagonis ensured that the 9X would sport a new, lighter and more efficient engine, with a power plant design team led by John Shepard, rapidly producing a bespoke four-cylinder power unit dubbed the DX, which was brought from the drawing board to the testbed stage in a mere nine months, this engine displacing between 750 and 1000 cc, and had a specific power output of 60 horsepower, with an overhead camshaft design that, very unusually for a British design of that era, sported a cam belt as opposed to a cam chain. While at the insistence of Isagonis, the 9X would be designed to use a new engine gearbox package that weighed no more than 200 pounds, as opposed to the 340 pounds of the A-series package, with an aluminium alloy used for the cylinder head and sump, and cast iron for the engine block. The result was a 1-litre prototype engine that produced 60 horsepower, far greater than the 40 horsepower available from the original Mini's 998cc engine, the new gearbox being a two-shaft design that was intended to be sighted beneath and behind the engine rather than below it, and was, therefore, supposed to be a lot quieter, as it did not rely on the transfer gear arrangement found in the existing package, with several of these engines being tested in standard minis so they could undergo development, the whole 9X package being designed with a view to simplify assembly and lower costs in order to remove the persistent loss being made on the production of regular minis while not compromising on the competitive pricing of the car to customers the 9X utilising an amazing 42% less separate components than the Mini. Sadly, despite all the enthusiasm surrounding the 9X, it was the internal politics of British Leyland that got the better of this promising scheme, as following the creation of the firm, Chairman Donald Stokes, who had formerly been Chairman of Triumph prior to the merger, took a very Triumph-orientated view towards the hierarchy of brands within British Leyland, and, subsequently, where investment should be sent to bring new and improved models to fruition. Stokes taking it upon himself to park many of the financial problems encountered by the entire corporation at the door of the newly formed Austin Morris division, which was under the control of ex-Triumph executive George Turnbull, with the intention of improving profitability and efficiency. The result was simple, 
cut investment costs where necessary, and focus on those models which are already making a steady profit. And therefore, despite engineers, designers and executives alike saying that the 9X was a superb machine, a large amount of financial input was still required to get the car to the full assembly stage, including production versions of the new engine, a finalised body shell, and Isagonis' ongoing request for a new platform. The short-sighted view of British Leyland's management, of whom several had actually driven the 9X and liked what they'd seen, being that the original Mini was still a strong seller, and thus there was no need for it to be replaced, causing the 9X to be shelved in 1971. In the wake of the 9X being discontinued, Isagonis, who had been knighted in 1969, retired from British Leyland and the motor industry, the car being the last full model he would ever create. But despite the fact that the prototype was never adopted for production, he continued to work on the project in his new office in Longbridge, where he was regularly employed as a consultant for the Leyland Company, from where he would often be in contact with the firm's management, requesting another look at his constantly evolving 9X scheme. That was until eventually, in 1987, when Graham Day, CEO of the Austin Rover Group, terminated his contract only a year before one of Britain's greatest car designers passed away at the age of 81. In conclusion, the 9X was another interesting what-if scenario for British Leyland, as from the perspective of drivers and potential customers, the car was leaps and bounds better than the original Mini, offering a far greater degree of innovation that would have put it on par with an emerging trend for hatchbacks throughout the course of the 1970s, including the Renault 5 and the Volkswagen Golf. The car, if it had entered production from as early as 1972, essentially being the first mass-production hatchback for the Super Mini class, and could easily have been a commercial barnstormer for the British motor industry in the same manner as the 1959 Classic. Instead, the 9X, like with so many promising British Leyland schemes, was killed due to the management not willing to take a risk or financial hit on putting the car into production while Mini sales were still so healthy. Despite the fact that the car could have easily complemented the firm's new lineup of small and large family cars in the form of the Allegro of 1973, and the range-topping Princess of 1975, resulting in British Leyland falling behind the competition and, thanks to its ruinous financial situation, being unable to create a viable hatchback competitor to the emerging market until the 1980 launch of the Austin Metro. Today, only one of the 9X prototypes remains in existence, this car having been personally saved by Isagonis himself, while the remainder of the running examples were cut up for scrap by British Leyland during the early 1970s, and the car is now on public display at the British Motor Museum in Gaydon near Warwickshire, a move for which motoring fans are eternally grateful, as it preserved what turned out to be the swan song of perhaps Britain's most famous car designer, and clearly illustrates that even at the end of his long and auspicious career, he had still not lost his touch for creating small but practical and incredibly clever road-going machines, and yet another example where the British motor industry could have seen victory snatched from the jaws of defeat. <laughs>